welcome back hey. to yes hey welcome back <laughs> and we have a special guest reader today can you guess who it is it's this giant beside me go ahead and introduce yourself dalionin it's great to be here so we're gonna make this amazing Yes, we're going to make this amazing. We are going to be reading chapters 2 and 3 of the the Richmond Survival Camp 3020 mm -hmm. book by Mr. Geo George Edenbaum. I have, again, my lovely daughter and co-host, Luna. Hello. And she has brought a wealth of sounds with her today. <laughs> Give us a taste. It's a sound hat. Yeah, what you want to hear? Oh no, pick something. Let's let's hear something. I'm gonna get this fire going. Ooh, spooky! I like it. <laughs> Perfect. Set in yes. the mood. Set in the mood. So we gonna get right into this, folks. So cuddle up. Get you a nice blanket or maybe a nice cushion. I don't know. Maybe you want some warm tea or some milk. Some snacks. Some sneaky snacks. Mm -hmm. And hunker down because we are on Chapter 2, Metal Scrap Down. Once again, I will be voicing Nadia and Sam. Mm-hmm. And let's begin. Go on, Nadia. <laughs> Good night, Mom. Good night, Dad, came Nadia's sleepy voice as Sam tucked her in properly into bed. She was finally ready to sleep. After a good treat of pizza, soft drinks, and enthralling tales of her camp adventures, she had a good well-lathered bubble bath, some good <laughs> old bedtime stories, a glass of water somewhere along the line, and 13 sweet kisses each from Mom and Dad. And with that, she was good to retire for the night. Thirteen sweet kisses. Let's see here. Let's let's let's, let's count them together. Why? <gasps> you gotta give me one. Two. Wait. <laughs> Three. Four. Six. <laughs> That's a they lot of kisses. Get that really fast, right? Okay, go to bed. <laughs> That's right. No more water. Stay in the covers. <laughs> With Nadia perfectly tucked in, Sam went to tidy up the kitchen while Daryl got himself a cold beer from the little chiller in the dining room area. As he sipped from the bottle, he moved towards the sitting room. He collapsed playfully into the worn-out couch. <sighs> Placing his dirty boots on the table, he picked up the remote and flicked on the TV. As he scrolled from channel to channel, looking for something to keep himself busy, he stumbled on the SafeWatch TV program on BBM. Look, Anderson, for years we have been trying to find a way to end the constant loss of good men to war and protect our homes and our families from all sorts of harm. I am certain that my administration has finally solved that problem for the United States. And when the whole world at large, no, admini no other administration could do it, I did it. Daryl sighed continuously as the president boasted about his success and the overall benefits of the Global Defense Initiative. I am telling you, Anderson, it'll be so great. No one will touch us. It will be the best thing that's happened in the history of all the world. Believe me, I alone was able to do what no president ever has. The president chided in an interview on BBN. These robots they are these robots are extremely smart and fail-proof. They'll learn, think, and make right choices in every situation. They are smarter than any human in the world, except for me. Machines could never do a man's job effectively yelled Daryl at the president in the TV set. Sam was just rounding up in the kitchen, and she had been listening to the broadcast from the kitchen. As she came out, Daryl turned to her, expressing his grievances. Do you hear this buffoon claiming these machines are fail-proof? <laughs> so unbelievable! Sam walked out towards him rather slowly. He was express expecting a response to everything he had said, but it looked like he was getting none. She got to him and finally shoved the, his dirty boots off the table. If you want to place your boots on my table, you have to clean them, said Sam as she snuggled next to him and give all of the machine talk a break. It's getting too excessive. 
I just don't think a few boxes of metal scrap solution in the world uh, to the world security problem. I mean, these things are machines after all. They could malfunction or something. Said Daryl, pointing to out a finger at the TV. I know it's not easy for you to accept changes because of these robots, said Sam in a very cold voice. But you still have to consider the bright side of things. The safety and peace an initiative could offer. That's the point, snapped Daryl. I do not believe these bots would deliver the peace and safety that is being promised. A lot of stories and movies tell similar stories that never ended well. From Frankenstein to Solo the First Android to Robocop and Terminator topping the list. No, this idea doesn't look like it's going to end well. Daryl stopped and sipped his beer. What exactly are you trying to say, Axiom? This situation could end up just like the movies. These things could malfunction, turn against us. That would be some serious Skynet shit happening, like, for real. And you get to be the John Carter that saves the day. Tease Sam. Daryl looked at Sam, smiled, and turned off the TV. Uh, I gotta hit the sack now. I have to report early to the precinct tomorrow. Daryl kissed Sam goodnight and headed towards the bedroom. Sam sat there for a while, thinking about everything Daryl had said. She could not deny there was some element of truth in his words. She thought all about the evil that could happen, should anything go wrong. It would be the end of the world as we know it, whispered Sam. Daryl woke up as Sam flung the curtains open. Wakey, wakey, sleepyhead, time to get work, came Sam's voice. Mmm, yeah, ugh, work, mm-hmm, mumbled Daryl as he struggled out of the bed. He took his shower quickly. What about Nadia? asked Daryl as he prepped to get going. Well, I let her have some extra sleep to make it all up for the hours she missed at camp, replied Sam. Ah, all right then said Daryl. I'll see you guys when I get back. I love you. I love you too, said Sam as she kissed him. Daryl got into his hideous truck, turned on the radio, and drove straight to the precinct. Parked in his usual spot and went right for the locker room. Greetings of a few fellow officers as he entered, his close friend and partner over ten years. Mason came around to the corner and clapped him on the back. Hey, Daryl, good to see you. Is Nadia back from that camp? Yeah, she is, replied Daryl. Looks like the old bat kicked you out very early today. <laughs> well, replied Mason, with a chuckle that made his face crease with wrinkles. <laughs> you know how she can be sometimes. Mason was way older than Daryl. He and his wife Maggie had been married for so many years, but were unable to have any children of their own. He and Daryl got close just before Nadia was born, and he and Maggie had since treated her like she was theirs. Nadia was a common treasure that kept the two families strongly bonded. So, how was Nadia's training camp? Well, it was good, it was good, real good, replied Daryl. She even offered to train me and Sam, you know, just in case these bots get out of hand. You know, I cannot wait for these machines to really finally take over, said Mason as they headed to the briefing room. We really don't handle any cases anymore. I didn't go through all my years of training to become some office clerk. Daryl laughed hard as they entered the briefing room. With all the officers seated and waiting, chatting with one another, Captain Higgins walked in. Morning, gentlemen of the precinct, came Captain Higgins' sonor sonorous voice. Mason loved his voice so much. Man, if I had that voice, I'd be working at a radio station, whispered Mason to Daryl. Of course, you've said that, like, every day, all these years, replied Daryl. But unfortunately, you belong with the frogs. <laughs> all right, gentlemen, came the voice of Captain Higgins. All the officers sat attentively, listening rapidly, like it was some early morning radio breakfast show. Captain Higgins briefed all the men and dismissed them to their daily jobs. And all the men left chattering excitedly. Mason and Daryl, could you two wait behind, please? came the voice of Captain Higgins. Mason and Daryl sat back as the other officers cleared out, and soon it was just the three men left in the room. Well, sir, stated Mason, 
When will all this be over? When is the GDI swinging into full force? <laughs> I would love to get a cabin in the woods and just spend the rest of my days hunting and fishing. I believe my days with the force have been well spent, I'd like to think. Captain Higgins shared the same concerns about the GDI, just like Mason and Daryl. He wasn't really in support of it. He believed the best protection a man could get should come from a man, and not some demonic tink tank, as he called them. Well, started out Captain Higgins, those retirement plans will have to wait. There is some classified work I need you two to check out. He dropped some files on the table before them. What the hell is this? questioned Daryl as he investigated the papers. Like I said, this is classified stuff. We shouldn't even know a dime about this as it's being handled by the feds, said Captain Higgins. Hey. How did you lay your hands on this, Captain? asked Mason. Well, some friends in high places, replied Captain Higgins, while sipping from a cup of hot coffee. Daryl was already buried neck deep into the papers, reading and absorbing every bit of information. His face wrinkled in horror as he read through the details. This happened last week, exclaimed Daryl in a low tone. Yes, replied Captain Higgins. One of the sentinels went crazy and took down three holiday cabins in the woods before anyone could take it down. Oh, that son of a bitch, exclaimed Daryl. Who? asked Captain Higgins and Mason simultaneously. The president! said Daryl, walking to the window. He was on the TV yesterday, talking about how much of a success the GDI has been so far. There's been one occurrence already. Only God knows how soon the next one will be. Well, another incident occurred barely 30 minutes ago, just on the outskirts of Tranquil Lake. Get there before the feds do. I need some first-hand information, Captain Higgins said. Daryl and Mason hurried out of the briefing room, running as fast as their feet could carry them. The other officers wondered why there was such a hurry. The Sentinels should be handling everything. Daryl and Mason got in the car and drove as fast as possible towards Tranquil Lake. Man, I knew this was going to happen sooner or later, said Mason. This is some serious shit, I tell you, said Daryl. And the president trying to cover this up? That's just so messed up. These are marvelous robots, Mason said, doing a fairly good impression of the president. Wonderful. Everyone tells me how wonderful they are. I even have one in my bathroom. <laughs> Daryl had a chuckle at that, but the humor was short-lived. As they got closer to town, they could see smoke rising in the distance. Let's play, pray we beat the feds to this race, said Mason. Daryl stepped on the throttle without warning, and the black police SUV sped down the highway, heading north as they drove away from the city. They were heading to Tranquil Lake small town outside the Richmond city limits that sat on a beautiful lake. Daryl thought back to the weekends he spent there with Nadia. They would go fishing, swimming, and camp out under the stars. Tranquil Lake was under Richmond PD jurisdiction since it was too small to support a police force of its own. The people of Tranquil Lake were strong supporters of the, G the Global Defense Initiative ever since the president promised that small towns like their own would benefit greatly from the Global Defense Initiative patrols and protection. The president promised that extra safety would bring more tourism that would support struggling small business owners. Daryl and Mason were both quiet during the ride. Both lost in their own thoughts, Daryl spotted a few guardians patrolling the area. The guardians were the least threatening of the GDI and came in various sizes, some as small as a house cat, while others were as big as the average human. The guardians performed different tasks from patrolling to making arrests and identifying targets. Everything had seemed so normal before. How did they get so different? Daryl hoped his fears about the robots would be wrong and that all his worries were the result of too many science fiction movie binges. As they arrived at Tranquil Lake, Mason spotted billows of smoke from behind a red house. This must be it, Daryl said as they both exited the vehicle and began to assess the situation. A small crowd of citizens had gathered around what appeared to be a malfunctioning sentinel. Sentinels were much bigger than guardians, faster and much more agile. Menacing, humanoid in appearance, and at least two heads taller than a full-grown man, stood on two legs with powerful arms and put the fear into anyone that stood in their path. Sentinels were able to leap large distances, run extremely fast, and even fly for short distances with their jetpacks. They were fighters, 
considered the core of the Global Defense Initiative, and their job was to fight and eliminate all threats to humankind. All right, nothing to see here, everybody. Go home, Daryl shouted, his gaze never leaving the robot on the ground. Soon, Daryl and Mason were standing in front of the Sentinel. It was down, but it was still buzzing and making sounds. Daryl looked around and saw two men holding rifles. He knew that those were the people to talk to. All right, everybody, it's time to go home, said Daryl as he walked towards two, the two men holding the rifles. You heard him, people. Move, said Mason, waving his hands at the crowd as if to push them away. Many began to leave, some mumbling to themselves. Only two boys stayed behind, both looking to be about nine or ten years in age. Frank and Kyle! One of the boys with an attractive cherub white face and thick floppy mane of curly brown hair remarked as he glared at the robot, Stupid talking toasters! As the other boy agreed. He was a bit younger looking, with a long, wavy jet black hair. All right, boys, you don't gotta go home, but you can't stay here, Mason told them. Fine, the boy with the curly brown hair said. I'm hungry anyway, the boy with the long black hair remarked. Me too, the brown hair boy remarked. What do you want to eat? Grilled cheese, the other boy replied with the grin. The boy with the brown hair stood there glaring at his friend for a moment before asking, you want to feel how hard I can punch, Nico? <laughs> Not particularly, the boy named Nico replied and laughed. <laughs> when he was sure that the two boys and everyone else had left, Sierra Mason joined his partner and the other two men. Good morning, gentlemen. I'm Daryl, and this here's my partner, Mason, said Daryl as he extended a handshake to the men. Well, I'm Bud, and this is my friend Kyle. Well... <sighs> That's quite some kill you brought down there, said Daryl, trying to be funny. The men chuckled a little. So, what really happened? Mason asked. And it was Bud who spoke up. This metal scum is, well, I think it's malfunctioning. See, we was all over here in the forest, minding our business and hunting when it started firing at us. Hmm, so how did you bring it down? Mason asked as he began taking notes. Well, we was all just lucky, said Kyle, who seemed very shaken by the incident. We look for any soft spots and lift the nets, we will do. But it looked nothing less than a hundred rounds of bullets to bring it down, taking the head out of the prostate. A hundred? exclaimed Daryl, looking straight at Mason. Mason and Daryl moved towards the big bot with absolute care. It was still making distorted sounds. As they got closer, they could hear exactly what the robot was saying. It was still spinning its head around, trying to scan the area. Daryl stood in front of it. Threats. The machine got to work, speaking out its procedures. Scanning for threats. Beep, 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 found. Beep, beep. Threat identified. Beep, 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 beep. Type human. Threat recommendation extermination Daryl watched as the green eyes of the robot turned red his fears had been confirmed he and Mason looked at each other in utter disbelief Mason Daryl said in a low tone we're in for some serious Skynet shit soon they heard helicopters approaching they knew it was best if they weren't there by the time the helicopters arrived they shook hands with the men and drove off towards Richmond as they went, there was the utmost silence in the SUV. Not a single sound from any one of them. If this was the case, then it was better to start running. Now. Gee, it's so quiet. Too quiet. Terribly quiet. Awfully quiet. And that was the end of Chapter 2. Yeah! Woo! That was intense! <laughs> All right, so now we're moving on to chapter three, which is called yes. Tis Some Serious Skynet Shit. <laughs> Luna, I hope you're ready with lots of sound effects. <laughs> I am. Okay. <laughs> when they got back to the precinct, they went straight to Captain Higgins and reported exactly what they had seen and heard. This is really serious 
sighed Captain Higgins. We need to find out exactly what is going on. You said the feds were there. Definitely, answered Daryl. We didn't stay back to watch. We left immediately when we heard them approaching. Very good move there, guys. They should never know that we were there, said Captain Higgins as he leaned back into his chair. Mm. He picked up the receiver and dialed a number. Beep, beep, boop, 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 boop. Mason and Daryl just stood there, watching as the call was picked up on the other end. Hello. I'm sending them that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, then. Right. Of course, of course. I know. Okay. They'll be with you soon. All right. Bye. Captain Higgins dropped the receiver and looked up at Daryl and Mason, who both stood still expecting some orders. All right, gentlemen. For this one, you're going to have to go totally stealth. I mean, you will have to go without your uniforms and police vehicles. Do take your badges and guns and receivers. Go to this address, said Captain Higgins, scribbling some details on paper. His name is Williams, said Captain Higgins, as he handed the paper to Daryl. He's a friend down at the Department of Defense. It was he who helped us with all this information so far. Make sure you're not followed. Yes, sir, responded Mason and Daryl simultaneously. Good. Now let's get to work, gentlemen, Captain Higgins said as he dismissed them both. As they headed to the locker room to change back into their casual wear, there was this huge look of worry on their faces. They both knew that things were out of hand already. All it needed was confirmation from a reliable source, and that was what they were going after. They got into Daryl's truck. It was the obvious choice, fast and reliable. As they drove towards the outskirts of town for the second time today, since engulfed in the vehicle, silence engulfed the vehicle. Both were thinking of the obvious, the aftermath of this Skynet shit. As they drew closer to their location, a cabin in the woods just outside the skirts of town, Mason broke the silence. Now that's the kind of cabin I want to retire to. Daryl managed to smile. Arriving at the cabin, they saw a man sitting on a railing, smoking a cigar and sipping from a little flask of whiskey. Daryl and Mason got out of the truck and waved at the man. You are follow, right? He asked. Of course not, sir, replied Mason, who was obviously going to be doing most of the talking. The man was just about his age, so it was going to be easy relating to him. I'm Mason and this is my partner. I know who you are, said Williams, puffing his cigar. Mason and Daryl are surprised by the response. You boys were at Tranquil Lake this morning, right? How in the world did you know that? asked Daryl. Williams smiled and took a sip from his flask and then replied, <laughs> Nothing goes past us at the DOD. The Fed spotted your truck long before your, you spotted their choppers. All right, sir, answered Mason. What is the situation of things right now? Critical, answered Williams in a rather cold tone. This is the third occurrence in a week's. The machines are... Mm. Williams stampered, seeking words to explain the situation to them. Uh, malfunctioning? suggested Daryl. Thank you, said Williams, but malfunctioning isn't the word. It's way more complicated than that. What do you mean, sir? asked Mason. William put out his cigar and set the flask aside. It was time to really get serious. When these machines were programmed, they were given a long list of priorities, with each priority ranking higher than the one before it. The last two priorities were the protection of human lives at all costs, and the protection of the Earth at all costs. We believe that this was the right order, since protecting the Earth would be protecting the people within it. We were preparing <laughs> for incidences <laughs> like meteor showers and alien invasions. Never did our minds think of such possibilities. What possibilities? asked Mason. The machines were built with an algorithm that made it possible to learn and adapt and make the right decisions in line with their pre-programmed priorities. Since their topmost priority was to protect the Earth, they have discovered that the Earth's greatest threat is, well, man, said Daryl, looking dazed. Well, you're right this time, Daryl. Mankind has been the Earth's greatest undoing. All our greed and wars and exploration has left the Earth in a very bad state. So to thoroughly save the Earth, man has to be taken out of the way. Well, okay, can't you just shut them down or something? Asked Mason. No, Daryl replied. 
They have done an override operation, making it impossible to shut them down or control them. Ha! How did you know that? Asked Williams, rather surprised. Uh, oh, I don't know. Robocop, Terminator, Frankenstein, you name it, came Daryl's answer. <laughs> wow, we have really outdone ourselves this time. We deserve a good old pat on our shoulder for being the authors of our own destruction, said Williams, looking surprised. So what do we do now? asked Daryl, looking at Williams and hoping for some real solution. Williams picked up his flask and stood up to leave. Run. Dun, 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 dun. Came the answer. Don't ever let those things corner you. Don't hide inside of buildings. They'll just blow it up. If you have the guts to face them in combat, just know it won't be fair and square. They were built to be formidable, so my best bet will be to run. Oh, and do say hi to Captain Higgins. Goodbye, gentlemen, and good luck. The whole world can't get enough of that right now. As Williams walked away, Daryl turned to Mason. Call Maggie now. Daryl reached for his phone and called Sam. Hey, listen to me carefully. Just do what I say. I will explain everything when I'm back home. Get Nadia and stay in the little underground bunker in the house. Do not come out for any reason until I'm back. Stay safe. I love you. Daryl ran towards the car. Mason followed suit. Were you able to get a hold of Maggie? Asked Daryl. No, she's not picking up, but I left a message, said Mason with some jitter in his voice. All right, said Daryl, driving as fast as his truck could go. As they got onto the major road, they saw a sentinel patrolling. Daryl stopped the car, staying still. But the sentinel looked at the car, and suddenly its eyes went red. And that was the cue that Daryl needed to get going. He sped off, going faster than normal. He looked behind through the rearview mirror and heaved a sigh of relief. Whew, I think we lost a man, said Daryl to Mason. They drove as fast as they could, heading towards the precinct. As they got inside, they headed straight for the captain's office. Captain Higgins walked up to them. I know, he said. The sentinel that didn't attack you attacked Williams. He distracted it and managed to bring it down using explosives. Uh Oh, wow, said Mason. How is he feeling? Uh, dead, came the captain's cold reply. He called me with his last breath, and all he could say was, They're coming, Higgs. Run for your lives. Oh, my God, exclaimed Darrell. What, what do we do now, Captain? Before Captain Higgins could answer, there was a deafening sound, and the entire room shook. The floor vibrated beneath their feet. Ceiling tiles fell, and the lights flickered and exploded. Before any of them could react, a second explosion came from outside, rocking the building as if it was being shaken apart by an earthquake. What the hell? Daryl heard Mason shout over the ringing in his ears as the acrid smell of smoke began to fill the room. Once on their feet, the three men ran towards the precinct's armory to get weapons. Anything better than a 9mm sidearm. A cannon would be nice, Daryl thought, and then paused to look through the window and saw a sentinel. It was firing at every moving thing in its path. People, cars driving by, anything that it detected as a threat. Just before Mason grabbed him by the shoulder and pulled him away, Daryl saw the robot take aim at one of those little electric cars and open fire. The automatic weapons on it, what Daryl thought must be a 50 caliber machine gun, ripping the small vehicle apart as if it was made out of tissue paper. The last thing Daryl saw was something blow up, blossoming into a yellow and orange fireball, and the body of someone shooting through the air like a rag doll a child had tossed up. That thing looked as if it was coming from town, and Daryl prayed his wife and daughter were safe. As they got to the armory, Captain Higgins sent them inside to get some heavy weaponry. Bring out the best and the deadliest you can find in there. All the other surviving officers gathered in front of the armory, while the armorer, a short, plump man who looked as if he was in shock, kept mumbling, "I, I, I, I don't know what's, I don't know what's going on. Do you, do you know? I, I don't know what's. Hello? I don't know what's going on." As he tried to hand out standard issue sidearms. Mason shoved the pistol offered to him aside, shouting, I want the big fucking gauge, Spencer! A, a, a shotgun? Spencer, the armorer, asked, still confused. Automatic weapons, Captain Higgins shouted. And armor-piercing rounds if we have them, Daryl suggested. 
Daryl and Mason helped the dumbfounded Spencer fill out all weapons they could, handing them over to the fellow officers who were shouting and demanding this gun or that, and ammo, lots of ammo. Get some more guns quickly, said Captain Higgins. This is not proper procedure, Spencer complained. Just then, another muddled explosion came from beyond the room. Everything shook, and the solid concrete wall off to their left cracked up the middle. You see that? Mason shouted at Spencer. That's not fucking proper procedure either, and if you stand there arguing with us, we're all gonna die. As he had shouted that, the sounds of automatic weapon fire could be heard coming from down the hall to them as officers engaged in the Sentinel in combat. Let's rock! Mason shouted. He not only had gotten himself a shotgun, but an M4 and slapped the clip into it, while snatching three others up and stuffing them into his pockets. Daryl had an M4 as well and two pistols and had just slid on a Kevlar vest. Here, he said as he tossed one to Mason. <laughs> Think this will do us any good? No, Daryl admitted. It looked like it had a 50 cal on it, but you never know. Daryl and Mason ducked down as they ran into the hallway. The two other officers followed behind them. Three were ahead, rushing down the smoke-filled hall. None of them made it far, as the wall across from them was shredded from automatic weapons fire from a sentinel. Bullets beyond count ripped through the concrete and plaster, blasting apart cinder blocks and sending dust and wood splinters into the air. The men in front of Daryl and Mason were hit before they knew it, almost exploding into a cloud of crimson mist as the bullets tore their bodies apart. Even as this happened, their training took over, and both men threw themselves onto the floor to avoid the fire. One of the officers behind them did the same. The other was too slow, and his head exploded as a 50 caliber round shot by the sentinel went through it and the cinder block wall beside him. Fuck! Mason shouted when the hailstorm of bullets had stopped. Move, move, move! The end of the hallway was gone. Well, mostly. There was a giant gaping hole there. Rubble and bricks scattered all over the floor, as well as the bodies of two other officers who had been shot dead by the killer robot. Another officer was ducked down behind a pile of bricks and concrete that had once been a wall, firing blindly in the direction of the sentinel as Daryl and Mason and the last remaining police officer in their group approached. Son of a bitch just won't die, the man said as he looked up at Daryl and Mason. Where the hell did you guys come from? Our mommy's tummies, Mason remarked. <laughs> Funny, Daryl said to his partner and then looked over at the officer who had been shooting at the sentinel. Where the hell is that thing? The man paused and in the act of loading another clip into his rifle and peeked up and out the hole in the wall. Ducking back down, he said, three o'clock, and then pointed over the wall behind Daryl. It seems to be looking on the far side of the parking lot. A couple of guys ran that way to try and flank it. It's fucking right on the other side of the wall, Daryl said softly as he looked at his friend and partner. Swell. Mason said with a sigh, and then crouching down, began to move slowly forward to try and see through the opening the other officer was taking aim out of. Daryl remained where he was for a moment, and for some reason looked up, noticing that the ceiling above them was gone. Just then he heard a muffled thump, and the ground beneath him vibrated. A moment later, a bright ball of orange flame shot into the air just visible beyond the edge of the wall above him. Then he saw it falling towards them, a patrol car falling out of the sky. Without thinking, Daryl jumped up and snatched onto the back of Mason's vest and pulled him back as hard as he could. A heartbeat later, the patrol car he had seen flying through the air crashed down into the hallway, landing right on the officer who had been ducking down behind the rubble, taking aim at the robot. Shit! Mason shouted. Flashbang! An officer shouted as he came up behind Mason, making ready to throw a flash grenade over the wall at the sentinel. Before Daryl could shout a warning, there was a loud whooshing sound like a rocket taking off and then a huge flash of light and hot wind as a missile shot by the sentinel struck the intact part of the building they had just come from. Daryl was thrown to the ground. Ugh! 
from the force of the explosion, and everything went black. Another rocket, shot by the robot, struck what was left of the building, destroying most of it and killing whoever had remained inside. Billowing clouds of smoke and fire rose into the sky as the sounds of conflict died down, as there was no one left standing to fight. The sentinel seemed pleased with its effort, turned away, and walked towards the direction of Tranquil Lake. The precinct was destroyed. All hope of protection from the sentinels was dashed against the rocks. And that was the end of Chapter 3. Yes. Holy moly, you guys. We'll see <laughs> y'all in the next one for chapters four and five. Hang on to your hats. You'll find out what's happened soon. See y'all later. <laughs> <laughs>